Following the October Revolution of 1917, the Bolshevik seizure of power led to the Russian Civil War which continued until 1922. The victory of the Bolshevik Red Army enabled them to set up the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Throughout the Civil War various religions, secularists and anti-clericalists of the Bolsheviks played a key role in the military and social struggles which occurred during the war. Religious situation before the October Revolution Since 1721 the Russian Orthodox Church had been the established Church of the Russian Empire. The Church reforms introduced by Peter I introduced a period of Caesaropapism to the ROC. This meant that while the ROC enjoyed substantial privileges, it was nevertheless subordinated to the state. As the intelligentsia became more critical of the Tsarist regime, this was often accompanied by a rejection of the ROC, and sometimes by a rejection of religion in general. Others, such as Leo Tolstoy retained a strong Christian belief but rejected the autocracy. He was excommunicated by the ROC. Some Bolsheviks, such as Vladimir Bonchbruevich, became involved with the religious minorities collectively called the sectarians. Bonchbruevich joined Tolstoy and Vladimir Cherkov in supporting the Dukobas, even sailing with a group of them when they migrated to Canada. Following the Bolshevik seizure of power, 11 days following the storming of the Winter Palace a council of the Russian Orthodox Church re-established the Patriarchate and elected Metropolitan Tikhan of Moscow as Patriarch. Tikhan refused to take sides in the civil war, although the official Bolshevik propaganda presented him, as well as the church, as supporting the whites. The Bolsheviks used the alleged support of the Russian Orthodox Church for the whites as their justification for killing clergy in massive numbers. Following the Bolshevik seizure of power, one issue they faced was the removal of the privileged position of the ROC. The Declaration of the Rights of the Peoples of Russia removed special privileges based on faith or nationality. This was soon followed by a decision by Sovnarkom to confiscate all the ROC's monasteries and educational establishments. When the Bolsheviks seized the Holy Synod's printing house, relations between them and the ROC became further strained. One issue was removing Orthodox Christian symbolism from state buildings. However, the Bolsheviks did not prioritize anti-religious campaigning, because they were concerned about how this would affect the popularity of the new regime. Persecution of the Church During the Civil War During the Russian Civil War, the Red Army massacred large numbers of clergy and believers often on grounds of alleged support for the whites. Much of these killings were not officially instigated from the top but were done on the initiative of local units of soldiers. In later years, the Church would declare that the excommunication was a misunderstanding based on the belief that these killings were officially instigated. However, later Soviet authors would claim central responsibility for these actions, including Yemelian Yaroslavsky who justified the campaign by claiming that the Church was fighting against them. Monasteries were widely attacked. Holy Mountain Monastery near Kharkiv was plundered very early in the Civil War. In a nearby Sketi in the village of Gorikova a monk named Israel was murdered for refusing to hand over the keys to the Sketi cellars. In the same area, a religious procession was attacked on its way as it rested the night, and two priests, a deacon, the owner of the cottage where they were staying at as well as his daughter were all killed. Metropolitan Vladimir of Kiev was the first bishop killed by the Bolsheviks on January 25, 1918. He had consistently opposed the revolution, and he was severely beaten as well as tortured before being shot outside the monastery of the caves. Before being shot by his murderers he prayed to God for them to be forgiven. 
In the Don region in February 1918 the Reds were killing every priest they could find. An 80-year-old monk priest named Ambrosi was beaten with rifle butts before being killed. A priest named Dimitri was brought to a cemetery and undressed but when he tried to cross himself before being killed, a soldier chopped off his right arm. An old priest who tried to stop the execution of a peasant was beaten and cut to pieces with swords. In the Holy Saviour Monastery, Red soldiers arrested and killed the 75-year-old abbot by scalping him and beheading him. In the Kherson province a priest was crucified. In a Cuban Cossack village an 80-year-old priest was forced to wear women's clothing. Brought to the village square and ordered to dance when he refused, he was hanged. In the Cuban Cossack village of Plotovy, Fr. Yakov Vladimirov was targeted by the Czechists for his popularity. They executed him along with wife and one of his sons. Germagen, the Bishop of Tobolsk, was killed along with other detainees on 16 June 1918 by drowning. He had organized a religious procession the day after the Tsar had come through to Bolsh on their way to Ekaterinburg, in which he blessed the royal family. He was arrested the following week and the Soviets promised to release him for 10,000 rubles, and later 100,000 rubles. When the ransom was collected and submitted, the delegation of notables and clergy that had delivered it were arrested as well. Germagen was reportedly taken on a river steamer, rocks were attached to his head and he was thrown into the water in Voronezh. Seven nuns who had prayed for a white victory were reportedly boiled in a cauldron of tar. Joachim, Archbishop of Nizhny Novgorod was murdered by red forces who hanged him head down from the iconostatus above the central a royal doors. The clergy in the Crimea suffered terribly. One priest named Uglyansky was killed by red forces on grounds that he used green ribbons instead of red ribbons on the church icon lamps. Churches in Simferopol, Feodosia and other parts of the Crimea were desecrated and their clergy were brutally murdered. Philosoph Ornatsky, a priest in Petrograd, was arrested in the spring of 1918 after giving a public requiem for victims of the Bolsheviks. He and 32 others were driven to a cliff overlooking the Gulf of Finland, where the priest was allowed to perform a brief funeral service and bless the victims before they were all shot and dropped into the sea. Archpriest John Vostolgov in Moscow, a famous Orthodox missionary and church activist, preached against the Bolsheviks and as a result he was blackmailed by the Bolsheviks, arrested and executed. He was executed along with Roman Catholic priest Lutoslavsky and his brother, two Tsarist ministers, and Orthodox Bishop Efren, former State Council Chairman I. Skacheglovatov and Senator S. Beletsky. F. R. Vostolgov conducted a short funeral service and preached to his victims to face death as a sacrifice of atonement, after which each victim came forward to be blessed by F. R. Vostolgov and the bishop, then they were shot. During the Red Occupation of Stavropol Diocese in 1918, the Bolsheviks killed at least 52 Orthodox priests, four deacons and four lectors. Priest Alexander Podolsky was tortured and killed for giving a tedium service for a Cossack regiment before it attacked the Bolsheviks. When a peasant came to collect his body, the peasant was shot dead on the spot. Fr. Alexei Milyatinsky was tortured, scalped and killed for preaching to Red Army soldiers that they were leading Russia to disaster and for offering prayers for the Cossacks. Even left-wing priests could be killed, such as Ivan Prigorsky who was taken out of church on Holy Saturday into the street, where red soldiers cursed him, mutilated his face and then killed him. In the Diocese of Perm, during 1918, at least 42 churchmen were murdered. A priest in Perm was killed by the Cheka who cut out his cheeks and eyes, and then paraded him through the streets before he was buried alive. Adronik, the Archbishop of Perm, was arrested immediately after the rite of anathema was performed in his cathedral. He was probably executed sometime shortly after December 1919. As a result of the unusual situation in which the local residents gave the Cheka popular support for these actions, 
they followed up a Dronix murder with mass killings of Perm's clergy including Vicar Bishop Ferov and of Solokamsk. A delegation from the All-Russian Church Sobor in Moscow went to Perm to investigate what had happened. While returning, however, their train was boarded and they were all shot by Red soldiers. Yakov Sverdlov ordered in June 1918 to take hostages from the ranks of industrial entrepreneurs, members of the Liberal and Menshevik parties as well as the clergy. Few of these hostages would survive. In the town of Cherniyar on the Volga, a lay missionary named Lev Z. Kuncevich proclaimed the Patriarch's encyclical to a crowd of people. Kuncevich was arrested and publicly shot in July 1918. Bishop Makaria of Vizima, who was beloved by the local population, was arrested as a result of his popularity in the summer of 1918. He was executed along with 14 others in a field near Smolensk, whom he ministered and attempted to comfort with blessings before their execution. One of the soldiers who executed him afterward confessed on his deathbed that he had killed a saint. Nikodim, Bishop of Belgorod, condemned acts of violence, plunder and murder in his sermons and he was arrested by the local Cheka commandant, Sayenko. At Christmas 1918, resistance from the population in protest to his arrest caused Sayenko to release him and ordered him not to preach those things again. The bishop continued to preach these things, however, and he was arrested again. A priest's wife who went to plead on the bishop's behalf was executed on the spot. The bishop was killed soon after, but they disguised his corpse to make it look like a soldier and threw it into the common graveyard. Between June 1918 and January 1919, in Russia there were killed one metropolitan, 18 bishops, 102 priests, 154 deacons, 94 monks and nuns, and there were imprisoned four bishops and 211 priests. The state sequestered 718 parishes and 15 monasteries, it closed 94 churches and 26 monasteries, it desecrated 14 churches and 9 chapels, it forbade 18 religious processions, it dispersed by force 41 religious processions, and it interrupted church services with insults to religious feelings in 22 cities and 96 villages. On January 14, 1919, in the Estonian university town of Tartu, retreating Red soldiers killed 20 clerics. Among those killed was Bishop Platon of Tallinn, two Orthodox priests, a Lutheran pastor and 16 laymen. Leontii, the Bishop of Astrakhan, was murdered along with most of the diocesan clergy in 1919 after he made a sermon that quoted Jesus' words, I was naked and you have clothed me, I was ill and you looked after me, and this quotation was interpreted as an attack against the Bolsheviks. In Kharkiv, a priest named Mokovsky was executed for criticizing the Bolsheviks in his sermons. When his wife came to get to his body, the Cheka chopped off her limbs, pierced her breasts and killed her. In the village of Popasnaya in the Donetsk Basin, the priest Trigujinsky was executed for a sermon that was interpreted as an attack on the Reds. A priest named Shangan was murdered and his body was cut in pieces. Archpriest Sertsov was beaten for several days before he was shot and his body was thrown into the Pekora River. In the town of Pekora an old priest named Rasputin was tied to a telegraph pole, then shot and then his body was given to dogs to eat. In Seleska Farnasi I Smirnov, a psalmist was executed for giving a funeral litany over a dead French soldier. The Bolsheviks closed churches and used them for other purposes. There were accounts of drunken orgies taking place in the desecrated churches. The pretexts for these killings was usually alleged support for the enemy, criticism of the Bolsheviks and or their ideology, or for liberal and or bourgeois sympathies. Telling people to follow God's laws above what the state directed was also used as a pretext for their killing. The uncertainty of the revolution's success in the early years may also have triggered some paranoia among the Bolsheviks towards groups that they 
considered threatening. The Orthodox Church must have thought that the Bolsheviks would lose power, because after Tikhan's election it declared that the Russian Orthodox Church was the National Church of Russia, that the state needed church approval to legislate on church matters, that blasphemy should remain illegal, that church schools should be recognized and that the head of the state as well as the top appointees in education as well as religious affairs, should be Orthodox. The Orthodox were the primary target due to their association with the old regime, although other religions were attacked as well. A Polish priest named Krapiowniki in 1918 was arrested on the Feast of Corpus Christi and scheduled for execution, but the execution was called off after intervention from the Polish government. After the papal protest against the persecution of the Orthodox Church, the regime retaliated by arresting Archbishop de Rop of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Modulev in April 1919, but he was later released to Poland in exchange for a Polish communist named Radek who had been arrested in Poland. Despite the fact that non-Orthodox religions had been persecuted under Tsarist Russia, leaders of other faith communities gave messages of sympathy to the Orthodox Church during this time. Many of these sects that had been persecuted by the Orthodox state found themselves better prepared for the situation post-1917 than the Orthodox Church. The state initially showed a friendly attitude towards Protestant evangelicals and Muslims while maintaining some pretense that they were only fighting against the Orthodox hierarchy for its relationship with the Tsar and not against religion generally. The leader of Russia's Protestant evangelicals, Ivan Prokhanov, joined the Bolsheviks in denouncing the Orthodox Church as reactionary. The Mennonite community numbered 110,000 in 1917, and it would emigrate from Russia in massive numbers in the following decade. There were 1.6 million Roman Catholics on the territory of the new state in 1917. There had been over 15 million prior to the war, but after Poland and the Western territories were lost, this number shrunk greatly. Christians outside of Orthodoxy would actually have some benefit of increasing membership in the succeeding years even while the Orthodox Church declined in membership. In 1900 about 11% of the population were Christians belonging to non-Orthodox groupings and by 1970 this number had become 31%. Muslims Muslims in the Russian Empire were attracted to the Bolsheviks' anti-imperialist stance. Due to the imperialism of Western powers over Muslim nations, despite their hard anti-religious stance, the Bolsheviks in the years following the revolution and during the civil war, were in a very poor position to fight against Islam in Central Asia. Therefore, the Bolsheviks appealed to them as allies and promised in political independence and religious freedom. In 1917 the Bolsheviks made this pronouncement to Muslims in Russia, to all toiling Muslims of Russia and the East, whose mosques and prayer houses have been destroyed, whose beliefs have been trampled on by the Tsars in the oppressors of Russia. Your beliefs and customs, your national and cultural institutions are declared henceforth free and inviolable. Organize your national life freely and without hindrance. This is your right. Know that your rights are protected by the entire might of the revolution and its organs. Support this revolution and its government. Many Muslims embraced this call and saw this revolution as a means of empowering Islam. An influential group of Central Asian Marxists led by Sultan Ghalib then took the initiative to try to reform Islam for the modern era and they were accepted by the state as a buffer between itself and the native population of the Central Asian republics. They promoted atheism in Central Asia, but attempted to give the impression that they were not attempting to fight against any religion. Reaction of the populace Much of the population were relatively indifferent to the fate of the church. However, some portion of the population stood up in the church's defense and ensured its continued survival in the face of the onslaught. The power of the church had been declining since the February Revolution. Church attendance began to raise itself again after Bolshevik atrocities became more widespread. 
the populations of some areas protected their churches and clergy, and even to pay for church costs after the state deprived it of any funding. After the elimination of all state support for religion, congregations had to rely entirely upon voluntary donations and voluntary support from their parishioners in order to continue. The Te Deum service was banned, but in some places such services in defiance. Some places, such as the city of Iuzovka the miners and industrial workers threatened the Bolsheviks with rebellion if they harmed the clergy or the church, and the Bolsheviks took no action as a result. In other places, the people were so afraid of the terror tactics that they remained passive and even clergymen would give in to obedience to Bolshevik demands. In the major cities, large crowds of laity cooperated and acted critically to save the churches there. In Petrograd in January 1918 Alexandra Colonte, the Bolshevik Commissar for Social Welfare sent troops to the Alexander Nevsky Monastery to confiscate it for social welfare purposes, and huge crowds of laity came to defend it. The troops opened fire on the crowd, but the laity kept their ground and would not be dispersed. Shortly afterward a religious procession in Petrograd with Metropolitan Veni Amin at its head marched through the city with several hundred thousand participants. Leagues of laymen began to form in many cities for the church's defense. In Moscow and Petrograd 6 to 10 percent of their population joined these leagues. These leagues took action in preventing the state from taking over monasteries. Between February to May 1918 687 persons were killed in clashes between these leagues and the government. These leagues were effective in saving the church, partly because the state found it harder to ignore the working masses who constituted these leagues than they did in ignoring the disenfranchised clergy.